All right. Good evening, everybody. How are you? We got another episode today. I got Court from Utah here. And um, Court is quite the uh, fly tire I was looking at on his page there. And looks like he dabbles in a bunch of different uh, trout there, too. And he does some rod building, which we'll get into there. So without further ado, Court, welcome, man. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing great. Happy to be here and um, awesome to have beyond here. So thanks for inviting me. I'm excited. This is actually my first podcast I've ever done. So nice. Well, forward. I'll make sure I'll make sure it's real tough. So you never want to. Do one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> awesome. So uh, what's your guys' fishing season like right now? And um, yeah, we're in the first week of March. Yeah, so we're, I'm in northern Utah. So Logan, Utah is kind of the, the big city here that people might know, Utah State University. Um, I actually grew up here, and this winter has been pretty crazy. Uh, it's great for snowpack. You know, we need the we need the water. Um, but we usually can fish through the winter time. The last several years has been, you know, easy access to our rivers here uh, due to low snow. So we've been able to fish throughout. And we have a tailwater uh, pretty close by that – that's an easy one to go hit. It's just a, about a 30 minute drive north of us. But um, our local rivers, we have two main local rivers here, the Logan River and the Blacksmith Fork River, are kind of the big, well-known ones here in our little valley. And those have been kind of tough to get to with all the snow and we just keep getting more. So it's been a little different this year, but typically our season will run. Um, I mean, March, we get start to get the runoff kind of th April, May, May, June. Um, but once that tapers off, uh, you know, late June all the way through November, it's great fishing right here in our valley. So it's been it's been good. But we've been trying to get out as much as we can this this winter with all the snow. Um, you know, sometimes we have to head further south down to fish like the Weber River, or the Provo River. Uh, but they've got hammered this year, too. So it's been great. We're we're happy for the, the moisture, though. Yeah, we um, I'm in Washington State and Western. Okay. And we got um, we got hit with um, a little bit of snow a couple of weeks ago. I had to think about that. Yeah. And then even, yeah, it was two weeks ago. I was supposed to go down to the um, Sandy River down in Oregon. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I mean, snow, ice, sleet, rain and mud, you can drive in, right? <laughs> but when it's ice, you can't do anything about that. Yeah, exactly. And in our, our season here in Western Washington to protect the salmon, or I'm sorry, the steelhead for spawning purposes is they shut the rivers down from uh -huh. uh, Super Bowl Sunday to Memorial Day in May. So if you're going to do anything, it's all still water fishing. And I'm not the biggest fan of still water fishing. Truth yeah. be told, I need to learn it, but it's definitely a uh, something I'm going to learn. And so I'm actually going out tomorrow to do a little bit of still water fishing. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I need to learn. I need to, I've dabbled in stillwater fishing my whole life, but I've never fully committed to it and ever learned it. I was actually just up in Western, well, I used to be Southwest Washington. I was up there in the Tri-Cities. Um, mm -hmm. What would that have been? The uh, last, gosh, I can't remember when I was up there, like the 13th of February, just before Valentine's Day, I was up oh. there. Um, I was doing some work up there actually in Kennewick and Walla Walla. Kennewick. Drove Drove over to Lewis in Idaho to do some steelhead fishing, and I'm not a big steelhead guy. I've only been this was my first time actually that I would say I was actually steelhead fishing, mm -hmm. and I had a guy that was generous enough to take me out, and we fished the clear water and the snake, and uh, no luck. But mm -hmm. uh, my route back home was going to go down through Kuski, Idaho, down through Boise, and they had a propane tanker spill up there on the oh. south fork of the of the Clearwater, I think it is. So I had to go back down around through Oregon mm. and it was cool. I got to fish the Wallowa River there and caught some rainbows and was right at home catching trout. So no stillhead off to put that away for another day, but I'd love to get back up that way and do that. It looks like a heck of fun. So it's cool. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely tough. Like I've just been back into the spay world. I think this is uh my third year, so I'm no expert at still had Sam. I'm no expert at any of it. I'm still <laughs> part of it, Dad. So it's funny to see the progression that some of your buddies will uh, go through. Like when you start out at the same time. Yeah. You know, and then it's like three, six months later down the road, you're like, where did that come from? You know, their <laughs> castings dialed in. They're yeah. dialed in with the fish. 
you know, and everything like that. For sure. Yeah, I we're uh, we're really big into the Euro nymphing game here, and I started Euro nymphing. God, it's been probably seven years now. I started getting into it. There was a a guy here at one of our local shops that uh, his name is Brian, but he got me into Euro nymphing, and I've just never looked back. And then I just got so heavy into it. So I actually work for a wholesale fly tying company, Round Rocks Flies. And so I started doing that and my boss was like, like, what are you doing? Like, I don't understand this Euro nymphing thing. And, and man, I started catching fish and they've slowly, it's all kind of taken on that. And we all do it. I'm pretty heavy into it though. I probably do that, you know, 90% of the time when I fish. And last summer I told myself, I was like, I got to break away from Euro nymphing a little bit. Cause I couldn't even remember how to cast a fly rod anymore. Oh, no. Bad. I got rough trying to cast a uh, dry dropper set up. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, but it's fun. I, I really like the challenge of your own nymphing. And, and that's kind of where my fly tying has kind of really adapted to is I love to tie your own nymphs and just something that obviously I tie what I fish. So that's just kind of how that's all been kind of born and brought about. That's a good segue. Um, I want to circle back to the Euro nymphing too, but let's talk about your fly tying. Um, I'm looking at your Instagram and um, if you guys want to go check it out, it's fly, F-L-Y, underline, catchy, C-H-C, oh, sorry, C-A-C-H-E. So it's F-L-Y, underline, C-A-C-H-E. That's that public school education you just heard there, boys and girls. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm looking at some of these, like you got some, you know, Copper Johns and, you know, a lot of other, uh, I'm not a trout expert, so those are really the only ones that I recognize. But one of the ones I really like that you tied is, um, it's called the Jailbreak Sculpin. And oh yeah, I love those colors. That's a lot of stuff that I tie, is stuff okay. like Zonker. Um, I like to try, like I'm just getting into fly tying too, and I primarily tie on um, tube flies. Sure. So I always try to use, the least amount of material that's going to give me the biggest movement. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That jailbreak sculpt. And that's kind of a offshoot of John Barr's meat whistle is what it is. That 90 degree uh, streamer hook uh, gets down really good. I, I, I wrap that with lead too. So it gets down pretty heavy uh, or pretty quick. Uh, I used it on the snake river, two years ago is kind of when we started messing around with that fly and I, I developed that shouldn't say developed it. Cause like I said, it's, it's just a, an offshoot of John Barr's meat whistle uh, a little different though. Um, materials are used, but we went smallmouth bass fishing on the snake river in Idaho. Mm. And I tied that one. I think the one you're looking at on my Instagram, is it an orange one? Is that the one? No, it's, um, it's the red, it's the pink. Um, with Oh, the, it's uh, kind of more of a steelhead color. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what so, attracted me to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good steelhead color right there. I've always liked that. And then, uh, but this I did it in an olive, kind of a crayfish color, and you know we were catching some really nice smallmouth on the snake, and we just uh, used full sink line. We'd cast out right towards these these rock beds, and and just uh, let them sink and strip, and we were catching some really nice, awesome four to five pound smallies and they're on my instagram too as well so that's what i was looking at yeah yeah so my instagram um fly cash just kind of tell you a little bit about that so Hmm? um cash is the name of my oldest son and then the valley we live in is called cash valley so that's where i get fly cash i tie flies here in cash valley and kind of after my son's name but yeah that's kind of where that all started off so do you um do you tie commercially or do you just tie for yourself? I used to tie commercially a little bit. There was a shop here in town that bought um quite a few of my Euro nymphs. Uh this was about eight, nine years ago. Um, or sorry, not like six, seven years ago, getting ahead of aging myself a little bit. But uh they bought my my first Euro nymph that I developed was a foxy nymph. And it's super simple, pheasant tail, body, pheasant tail on the tail. And then I use fox squirrel dubbing at the collar, heavy tungsten bead. Okay. Uh, that was the first fly I really started fishing when I did Euro nymphing. And that fly just killed it, just did really well. So that really was what hooked me on Euro nymphing. And so then I started kind of tinkering around with more flies. Then I developed the B12 shot, which is one of my patterns that um, 
super effective. And this shop here, Al's Sporting Goods is the, the name of it. Um, they bought that fly from me. So I tied commercially for them for, you know, two years or so selling a bunch of different patterns of mine that I have there. Um, and then, uh, I don't tie commercial anymore. Like I said, I work for Round Rock Flies is the company I work for. So we're a wholesale company. So all my flies, basically whatever I, you know, develop and design there gets sold commercially through, through them now. So that's where I'm at with that. And so do you, is that what you do for your full-time nine to five? It is. Yep. So kind of living out a dream job right now. So I really love it. So yeah, my, my main thing with Round Rocks flies. So it's kind of like, uh, some people might not, may not have heard it. We're not as, as big as like your, you know, your umquas, your Montana flies, but it's along the same lines as that. We, we, we mass produce flies. They're tied overseas. My main job is the quality control of those flies and the production of them. So I oversee the, the production of our flies um, they come back through our shop here in Hiram and I'm able to look at them, develop them from there. And it's really cool. So kind of see that work all, all come to fruition and, and see that fly go into multiple bins across America is, is pretty fun. That's pretty cool. How did you, um, well, let's take it a step further. Um, what did you do before this? So this, <laughs> it all kind of lines up. It's kind of a, a, a fascinating story. I think it's fascinating anyways. So when I was in college, uh, this would have been back in 2008, 2009, um, I was in college, they, Utah State University here in, in Cache Valley, they offer a fly fishing class, a fly tying class, and a rod building class. And it's all wow. just an easy PE credit you can just take as an elective for, for school. So I went into school to be a therapist, was kind of my main goal, was to be a marriage and family therapist. And I took these classes and I met Steve Smith, who taught the flight sign class. And I just liked it so much. I just kept taking the class. I'd take it like every semester. And I think he just got to the point where he was like, hey, look, do you just want to work for me instead of <laughs> you know, just taking the class? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I worked there for a little bit during college until I graduated. And I was just pulling orders, you know, nothing crazy. And I graduated, got my degree. Um, me and my wife moved south down to, towards Salt Lake. And I was working at the U, uh, Utah University. And uh, so that kind of like broke off that relationship there with, with Round Rocks Flies. And I just kind of thought, oh, that was fun. Um, but I kind of kept in touch with Steve a little bit. Just, you know, we both like to fish. And so um, I'd ask him to go once in a while and we'd go fishing or whatnot. And then my job... I worked for the state of Utah as a social worker. And so I actually got transferred up to Logan. So I was back in my home area working with families and, and people who, you know, were addicted to drugs and, and, and that kind of thing. So I really loved that job. It was fun to do fun to work with people and see that kind of change. Uh, but when I got back up here to Logan, I randomly bumped into Steve again at a football game at Utah state university and he's like, hey, I've been trying to track you down. I can't find you. And I didn't have Facebook back then or anything like that. And he was like, I need somebody to teach my fly tying class. Could you do that? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I started teaching his fly tying class to the university. He had started uh, basketball, coaching basketball at the high school. And so I jumped in, started teaching for him and just fell in love with that and teaching people how to tie flies really became a passion of mine. Uh, I really enjoy it. And being able to see them progress as well was was just fun. So and it was kind of an outlet for me because that social work job was super stressful, mentally exhausting. And I was just like, this is just a great outlet. I'm able to to do something other than work with people who have addiction. And so from there, I, I taught those classes. Uh, I started teaching the fly tying class and then the fly fishing class. And I did that for about uh, two, three years. And then that fast forwarded, you know, over the next several years here. So I'm trying to think I've been working for Steve now for about four years now. So this is all over the span of the last 10, eight years when all this took place. And uh, he just got to the point where he bought the company from his dad. Um, and he said, Hey, I need somebody to come on and help me with the day-to-day -day stuff here at Round Rocks. So I took that position to be able to come and do that full time. So I, I quit my job at the state and I said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to work a dream job. You never know when that chance is going to come again. 
Um, all the stars kind of aligned with that. And I get to, I get to dabble in feathers all day and tie some flies and, and go fish. So I can't ask for more. And the best thing about it is, you know, fish don't talk back to you. So that's the best part. I don't have to deal with the people anymore. Uh, but no, it's, it's fun. So that's kind of how that whole career path got me here. That's good. And then, um, so Euro nymphing, how long have you, um, been doing Euro nymphing? So I've been Euro nymphing probably for the last six years. If I have all my, my dates right on that, cause I'm trying to think, but yeah, I got into Euro nymphing about six years ago. And like I said, I, the one guy that I was selling these flies through one of our, the this retail store here in town, um, they picked up a few of my flies and the guy there was like, he took me out, kind of showed me how to Euro nymph. And I just, it just kind of lit a fire under me. And I, I really, I don't think I touched a regular rod for over a year. I just didn't stop indicator fishing. I didn't dry fly fish. It was just so fun just to, to kind of fill, you know, you fill the take when you're, you're on nipping, you know, your tight line, you're pulling the, the, you're, you're basically dragging that fly down through these runs and you can feel that fly tick in the bottom. And then all of a sudden your line just tightens up and your rod just doubles over, pull back, and that fish will just come leaping out of the water. And just it was just really fun for me to do that. So I've just kind of never looked back and just kept doing it. So when you guys met um, and the the guy you're talking about looked at um, one of your flies, how did that conversation come about? Was he like, you know, hey, cool flies, you want to go Euro nymphing with me? And you were like, what is Euro yeah. nymphing? Yeah, so um, he uh, – I, I brought those flies and he well, so he got me into your own imping. Let me back up. So he kind of showed me how and I was using some of his flies. And then I was already tying flies, you know, just kind of nymph nymph, I uh, tied nymphs and dry flies and whatnot. And so he got me into the Euro game. And so I bought a couple of packs of just these jig hooks. Mm. And I started just tinkering around and, and messing around with materials and that. And that's when I came up with the first two patterns, the Foxy nymph and the B12 shot. And uh, I, when we went out again, I just showed him those flies and he's like, Oh, those look really good. And we used them and we both caught fish. And so that's when he approached me about, uh, tying commercially for them and, and putting some flies in their shop. And that's where, where that happened. And like I said, that went on for about two years and, and then I, I kind of got out of that. Um, and then I started doing the, uh, the wholesale thing on, on this side. So kind of that time frame of the last six years, I just kind of stopped tying commercially. And then, um, Walk us through your um, Euro nipping setup, rod, line, and, and uh, all yeah. Of that. So I have two Euro rods. I have uh, a Cortland competition rod. It's a ten foot six three weight. That's the first rod that I I, I got. Uh, still still use that one. I love that rod. Then I have a Sage Sense, and that's a that's a ten foot. That's also a ten six three weight as well um both rods are, are fantastic i'll i don't really have a different or opinion on which is my favorite they both work really well um my reels i run an old lampson waterworks reel i, I think it's the like original guru that they came out with and, and i just basically tur turn that fly that fly reel into my euro nymphing reel and I run Rio, um, I can't remember the name of the line that's on it, but it's just a Euro nymphing line. And then from there, for me, I I run off of the end of that line. Um, I just have the indicator line, this, uh, what is it? I need to get my bag. But it's, uh, it's just the strike indicator line that they have. Um, I run about 18 inches of that. It's multicolored. And then from there, depending on the depth of the water, I'm going to run, uh, you know, anywhere from three to five feet of tippet um, and then down to my first tag. And then below my tag, about a foot to 18 inches is my anchor fly. So the tag, I, I typically don't have weight on my tag fly at all. I like to go non-bead. So I'll tie a lot of flies that are non-bead, um, bars, emergers, that kind of thing, uh, soft hackles. And then my anchor flies are kind of where I really like to design those big, heavier Euro nymphs. So uh, the V12 shot Foxy, uh, just something that's going to get down and anchor that fly down to the bottom. Uh, but typically my my setup is it's very basic. I know there's a lot of different formulas out there and there's a lot of good information on how to run a, a Euro nipping line. But what's worked for me, honestly, is just buying that, that Rio line right out of the box. I think it's just a competition Euro nipping line. It's just a flat line. There's no taper to it at all, mm. all the same diameter. And then from there, I'm just using my, uh, my indicator line 
uh, hot slips the name of me what that even is, but it's just the bright colored, like orange and pink. Yeah, I know line. what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's like 12 pound test. And then from there, I just run my tippet. And I, I usually run my tippet very light. It's all fluorocarbon. I'm usually anywhere from six to five X, depending on the river. Wow. I'm in. So I run it really light. Six X, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I get made fun of that a lot. <laughs> Good on you for a six X. Um, what size fish are you catching on that? So typically around here, you're not going to catch much, uh, anything over 16 inches. So they're pretty small fish that are, we're, that we're dealing with here locally. Um, we go down and fish the green river below flaming gorge yearly, and I'll bump it up there from a five or a four X. And then on the Madison river in Montana, we hit that every year as well. And that's also, I'll bump it up right there. But typically I, the first year I started Euro nymphing, we went up to the Madison and I didn't know any better. I just fished six X and I had no clue. And I was breaking off on white fish, every yeah. single fish I got. I mean, they just run, I couldn't turn them and they just snap. So I was like, all right, I can't just keep doing six A. <laughs> so, but that light line, I mean, you can just, you cut right through the water and you can fill every take and there's something to be said about it. But yeah, it's definitely a challenge to land some of the bigger fish you hook into. Yeah, it's tough, man. I know the creek, um, when I lived in California that I grew up learning how to fish on there, we would tie knots and break them. And I'm like, yeah. if I'm breaking these tying knots, how am I going <laughs> to even get a fish? But it's funny because, you know, there would be days where we would go from like, we would go, you know, we would start off at like 5X and 5X wasn't working. And, you know, we'd have to change out all the flies. We'd have two, three fly rigs going on. And yeah. then 5X wasn't working. Then we'd have to go 4X and 4X didn't work. Then we'd go 6X and then 6X you would have fish, but then they'd break off. So then you had to go and then, you know what it's like changing two, three flies out. Oh yeah, the forceps out on the shank of the hook and spin it <laughs> up. And put the, oh, it's a nightmare. That's why yeah. you pray that you get the right tippet at the right time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, the I I'm one that I'm like uh, I don't like to switch my flies out. I'm gonna just fish it, and I don't want to change. And I'm pretty stubborn that way. And so yeah, I I definitely know what you're saying there. Yeah, that that's tough. That's the whole. Uh, that's the biggest challenge I had getting into the whole multiple fly setup yeah and, and i always say this whenever the conversation of your own nymph nymphing comes up back in like 2006 i think is when when it was where we started doing that and nobody had a name for it uh -huh. we started putting indicators on and it was super deadly and effective and we would never take an indicator off i mean very mm -hmm. rarely we would but like you said with your own nymphing you're basically high sticking and you're basically drudging the bottom almost. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the, like the first trip I went on the Madison river, I was with the, that crew with my, my boss and his family. It's kind of their family trip. They go on up there and, and this was before I was actually working for him. Um, but I just got invited and went up and, and they were all looking at me like, what, what are you doing? Like, what is that? Like they, cause on the Madison in, in May, when the runoff starting, you know, that water's a little chocolatey and I mean, it's Pat's rubber legs and a gunslinger, one of our flies that we sell. I mean, it's San Juan worm yep. indicator split shot. You know, you got all those different hinge points and they catch fish. Off. I mean, they, they pound fish. And then I stepped in with a Euro rig uh, right off the boat ramp before we even got in the, in the river. And the one guy that's, that I was in the boat with, we were getting in his boat, his name is Jeff. And Jeff's like, all right, show me how you urine him. Like, what is so good about your own thing? And so I stepped into this run just right off the boat ramp. It was like right below Reynolds Bridge on the Madison. And I just, I have two flies on. I drop it in, pull it high, stick it through, bam, fish, rainbow, you know, and then I catch another one. And he's like, what the heck? And he throws his indicator rig through there. And he's like, I don't, he didn't get, he caught like two fish out of there. If I remember right. And I caught like six. So he kind of like the whole time we were floating the river, we'd get out and fish and he was just like, just mesmerized and asking me questions about it. And it took him a while. He was like, I'm not quite converted yet. I don't, you know, I don't think I'm right there yet, but I finally got him and he, and he started your own thing. So it's pretty fun. Now we go out together. And like you said about your, your buddies, you know, spay fishing and that, but it's, you watch them and you're like, yeah, see, like they all kind of start out with their own system. And then they just, what did you change to that? What's your... Like, how are you doing it different now? And all the different adaptations, there's, there's tons of different adaptations for your own nymphing now. And 
lots of different formulas for your leader and and how far apart your fly should be in the weight of your fly and all that. But uh, it's just fun. It's fun to learn from everybody and see how people do it. And there's always something you can take away from anybody you're fishing with, which, you know, that's why I love to go out with, with a buddy just to learn from them as well. Yeah. I like doing that with multiple people too, because like you said, you know, it's the whole iron sharpens iron, right? Yeah. You learn from each other, you, you push each other in a, you know, loving way from there. And you just, you, you become, you are, and you become what you put yourself around. Absolutely. You know, I remember hearing a story about uh, a professional basketball player and they were saying that their coach one day told them, look, now that you're a professional basketball player, you can't play basketball with your friends anymore. Yeah. And the guy was like, what do you mean? Those are my best friends. I grew up with them. And he said, I get that, but you have to think of it this way. If you go play basketball with your friends, that's honestly going to make your professional level. It's going to make it deplete a little bit just because I'm not saying your friends are bad, but Mm -hmm. if you're playing, you know, par three holes every day golfing, and then you get to a par five or par five, you're not going to be used to it. And yeah, just kind of goes down the drain, whether you know it or not. So that's why I love getting around multiple people there. Definitely. Euro nymphing's uh, it's a challenge. And I think the reason most people kind of steer clear of it is because you're going to lose a lot of flies. Oh yeah. Yeah. And when flies are, you know, three, five bucks a piece, you know, you're going through, I mean, you could go through a handful of flies super quickly. You're $30 you know into it already (laughs) i hate losing my own flies that i tie and that you know that's painful enough and it's you know that when i first got into it i I, i'd read about oh well the hook rides hook point ups you're not going to snag up as much i'm like well that's that's bull because i (laughs) i'm hanging up all the time i'm constantly losing flies and so that's like i'll tie a box full for a trip and they'll be like why do you have so many of the same flies like so i'm gonna lose half of them yeah. I'm gonna snag up. They get wedged down in the rocks. You're snagging logs, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's yeah. And then so that's just part of the game though. So catch a lot of fish doing it though. Do you use indicators at all? I do. Um, I don't use an indicator on my Euro rig. I just have that cider line. That's the name of it. Finally came to me. The cider line that's on there. <laughs> um, I use that. Um, but yeah, I use I use an indicator rig. Um, I'll switch back and forth. It just kind of depends on the water that I'm fishing. Um, and like I said, last year, I forced myself to, to get back into indicator fishing just to remember how to do it and, and how to cast again. I just couldn't remember how to cast a regular fly line. Like I was struggling with it. And so, um, yeah, I, I like the indicator nymph too. Um, so I, I'm pretty good about, I think now <laughs> over the last year, trying to dedicate myself to switch back and forth. And if worst case scenario, I just bring two rods and rig one up with an indicator rig and the other was my euro rig and and just go from there so there's certain types of water that i like you know the the fast tumbly water um, i like euro nymphing in and those slower deeper pockets just sometimes it's just harder to beat an indicator rig you just can't do it so you have to get those flies down and have a long tippet and and something that euro nymphing you just can't quite reach that far yeah, that's one thing. Um, once our rivers open back up, like I've been so focused on just getting my spade casting dialed in. And I'm at the point now where I'm just like, I got to just relax and just be like, let's focus on fishing now. I yeah. get back into, um, you know, using indicator systems, you know, for steelhead because, you know, that's what um, I grew up on the American River in Sacramento. Okay. Uh, I grew up my fly fishing, I should say there when I went back down there in my twenties and a good buddy of mine, Brian, who's a guide out there now in the um, Sacramento area there. That's what we did a lot of was, you know, we would use like big size, like 10 and 12 copper John patterns and, you know, basically nymph patterns, but bigger size. And we would do the whole, you know, two fly setup, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. on indicators from there. And granted, we didn't have the best steelhead run from there and we couldn't um, touch the salmon you know, that year, but yeah. um, it's something that I definitely want to get back into. Cause I mean, you think about it when you see gear guys out there, they're using floats and it's super effective. Yep. And so I have to keep telling myself, 
well, you have the same tools. Why don't you go back to doing what it is you know how to do from there instead of being stubborn, like a typical yeah. guy and like, I'm going to yeah. figure this out. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I, I remember the first time. So when I first started fly fishing, I was, I self-taught myself like that. Mm. I didn't have a family member that, that fly fished. My brother, um, oh, my older brother, he actually took a fly fishing class and uh, a course from somebody here that, that taught it. And he never really did anything with that from there. Like he, I think he went a few times, but I ended up, I think, just stealing his rod from him, messing around with it in the backyard, casting in the grass. And so I only knew dry fly fishing, really. I, I just taught, kind of taught myself. I probably made so many mistakes, but um, I didn't start your own, or sorry, I didn't start nymphing until when I was 13 when I started fly fishing. I probably was 23, so it was 10 years before I even realized what a nymph really even was. I had no one to learn from. Didn't have YouTube back then, didn't have anything like that. And I didn't have a driver's license to get in and talk to people at the shop. So I just kind of self-taught. Um, my parents were gracious enough to get me a, a, a setup and, and some stuff. But I didn't even know there was a difference between tippet and a leader. So I'm fishing this tapered leader and I'm tying dry flies off and it's getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And I'm like, I got to go buy another line. I mean, this sucks. Spinning, spin fishing, I don't have to worry about that. So but yeah, I, you know, I burned through a lot of taper bleeders then before I really realized what tip it was in the beginning. But yeah, I, I just started nymphing when I was 23 and uh, had another guy, um, family friend of ours that taught me how to nymph and use a float and use an indicator. And, uh, you know, I was like, geez, I can catch a lot more fish doing this than I can dry fly fishing. Yeah. So uh, I kind of got hooked on the nymph game. <laughs> yeah, dry fly fishing. Um it's just, I, mean, I think as guys, especially, we're so visual. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why dry fly fishing is so attractive to us to be yeah. able to see the take. And, you know, I mean, I've only caught in one fish. It was a little 10 inch trout, you know, on a caddis fly. And I was yeah. like, oh, wow, I did it. Yeah. Yep. I'm so ecstatic. Yeah. I can see, like, I hear stories of people that will catch steelhead on dry flies yeah and i'm like well, one to catch a steelhead is a feat in itself but then when you can do it on a dry fly you're kind of like a steelhead master yeah for sure that i've heard about that those guys using like the like what is it, the bombers or whatever they mm -hmm. are oh that looks so cool they're skating the flies across yeah. the top. Uh, yeah it looks awesome i would love to be able to do that but i just want to catch one <laughs> yeah how far away are you guys? Um, I know you mentioned it earlier, but how far away are you guys from the closest place you can um, um, chase steelhead? So we're probably about four hours north of us. If you get up on the Salmon River, um, I know that there's some up there. And then, yeah, just outside of Boise there, you get on the, the South Fork of the Clearwater. That's probably a five hour drive, four and a half hours. Oh, so dang. not crazy. It's not crazy far. Uh, it's just hard for us because we're so close to some of the best trout water in the West. I mean, we're, you know, we're an hour and a half from the Provo. The, we're three hours from the Green. We're three hours from the South Fork of the Snake, uh, four hours from the Madison. So it, it's hard to pass those rivers up and to go to go steelhead fishing. But it's something that as an angler, I just want to learn how to do that and learn how to and just kind of open up that box and just. Uh, increase my knowledge in fly fishing in general. I think, you know, there's a, there's a great learning curve in all these different types of fly fishing and they all translate back to what you do on your home waters as well. You can take what you learn from steelhead fishing and apply that on your home waters when you're just, you know, fishing, nymphing or whatever it is. There's a lot you can just take from each types of those fishing and apply it across the board. Yeah. That's why I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm excited, but I'm not excited um to do the whole still water fishing thing yeah like i said our rivers are closed until memorial day um and usually what i'll do is you know like last year i made a trip out to the olympic peninsula with the guide um that was fun um and then like i said this year i plan on going down to the uh the oregon coast um it looks like we might be trying to do that next week like i was telling you earlier we couldn't get down there the last couple of weeks when we, yeah. because everything was um, for safety reasons, they closed all the gates and everything for the ice 
that they were anticipating in some of the snow. But to your point, though, any aspect of fly fishing and fishing in general, it's all building blocks to whatever it is you want to do. And I think for me, I mean, like I said, I've been doing this three years now and I've probably caught in five fish maybe. And the majority of those five came from the pink salmon run we had yeah. you know, the odd year. But I mean, like yeah. I've caught in, you know, a bull trout here and that's awesome. Yeah. And I mean, that's really the extent of it, but I'm looking forward to what building blocks will come from the whole Stillwater experience there. Even if they're, you know, little 10, 15 inch, you know, man, it's a man-made lake. So it's not going to be anything gigantic by any means. Yeah, for sure. You know, the, the best analogy I learned about Stillwater fishing is it's like golf where you can just have, you can golf with one club and it's really tough, but you can do it. You can putt your way down the fairway and get to the green. And it's the same thing in Stillwater fishing. You can go out and fish a floating line, but you probably ought to have a good arsenal, the whole irons, the driver and everything in your Stillwater lineup. You want to be able to fish every depth. And I think that's the thing that intimidates a lot of people from still water fishing. And I'm no pro. I'm still, there's so much to learn about still water fishing for me, but you know, you want to have a floating line, an intermediate line and, and, you know, all these variable line depths to get down and find where these fish are. And that's the hard part is I think a lot of people look at a lake and say, one, I don't know where to start. And two, I can't get down that deep. And a lot of times it's, I don't think you have to get down quite as deep as you think. And if you do, you might as well just be trolling anyways. So um, but from my experience doing it, I mean, we're only fishing the first 10, 12 feet of water when I actually am out still water fishing, unless we're fishing chronomids off the bottom, and then you got to get a full sink line and get it down. Um, but you know, it's, it's fun. I, I really enjoy still water fishing. I've had some really great days and the fish are, you know, the majority of the time, the fish are just so big and healthy and they fight so hard in that open water. Uh, it's just, it makes it a lot of fun, but, um, I would just say anyone starting stillwater fishing, you know, pick up a, you know, have a floating line. If you can find yourself a cheaper, you know, type three sinking line or type four and just start from there to stripping woolly buggers mm-hmm. and break the lake down, break the lake down like you would any other river and just kind of look and say, this looks like a shelf and I want to focus on that shelf and, and cast around those structures and those areas and, and see what happens just it's a guessing game sometimes and you know like where i say i'm i'm no professional at it but um even a blind squirrel gets a nut sometimes i guess so (laughs) when i was a kid my parents um we lived in a little man-made lake and uh it was it was probably like a quarter mile the whole lake and it was small enough to where you couldn't have any gas powered anything it had to be all battery operated so yeah um, they stocked it every year, and I think it was like the first week of April when they did it, and we had a little Pelican paddle boat, and I had a little five-weight <laughs> um, fly rod with a floating line with like a, yeah. you know, 15-foot package leader with a woolly bugger on there, and every time I'd go down to one little section and make that swing, I'd get hammered Yep. <laughs> on that swing as it's coming back up, and I was like, Oh, okay. Maybe I should throw in a merger on and begin with that. But yeah, that was fun. Yeah. I remember, so my, my, I had a similar experience growing up. Like I, I grew up spinner fishing. Like we, we would go and just on the local little river here in town where I grew up at a uh, little bear river and it, uh, chuck full of, we didn't know what gem we had when we were kids. We had no idea, but it was just chuck full of browns, rainbows mm-hmm. and we had large mouth in there and you know i think they all got dumped out of the reservoir up above the the river but we just didn't know and we we thought we were just like bass masters like we were <laughs> professional fishermen you know like we're 13 12 10 years old and, and just pounding these trout and we didn't realize how good we had it and then uh my cousin when i started getting into fly fishing my cousin and his grandpa was a biologist mm. and he created a dam i don't even know if it was legal but he made a dam out of the the creek down there that kind of shoots off into the river and he started just uh breeding his own fish allegedly allegedly right yeah allegedly yeah allegedly yeah (laughs) (laughs) so he would like he would go down there and we just catch these monster rainbows i mean they're 20 24 inch rainbows 
And that's where I first started learning how to still water fish and just, I would just strip a woolly bugger. I just cast it and just start stripping and they'd come and hammer it and we'd catch those fish and we thought we were just so cool. And then you go to a real lake and you're just like, oh, I'm not really that good. <laughs> Give It humbled you a little bit, but no, it was, that was a lot of fun, but I think it's just a, a fill game, you know, and you, you got to learn the the cadence of how you strip that fly back in if you're using a, a streamer and patience game if you're using those chronomids and, and little damsel nymphs, so. Yeah, when I was learning how to um, um, trout fish, I don't want to say the name because it's uh, people know where it is in California, but it was a creek. Um, in the 70s, they built a dam, and so these trout would go in and out, or the steelhead, I guess, would go through this lake and go into this creek to spawn. Well, as they threw this dam up, um, the steelhead got caught in there, obviously, and so they breeded with the trout. So these trout in this creek have steelhead blood in them. Uh -huh. They were anywhere from like 25 to 30 inch trout with still had blood in them. <laughs> wow. We were catching them on uh, my good buddy, Brian, um, taught me how to fish that Creek. My dad taught me, uh, my dad introduced me to fly fishing on this Creek and it was yeah. kind of cool before he passed away. I got to show him one of these big fish. He went out fishing with me, but yeah, it was massive. We were catching them on like, you know, size 18 zebra midges and, you know, sometimes like size 20, you know, two, three fly setups on like, you know, 4X and 5X tippet from there. It was just nuts. And I was like, that's crazy that you're catching these big fish on just such small tippet from there. I couldn't understand it, but my buddy Brian had it dialed in. It was wild. Huh. That's so cool. Yeah, that's that's fun stuff. That That's awesome. Like, yeah, like I, I look back at that little river that we fish. It's all, I mean, it's all been stuck dry now for you know irrigation and whatnot mm -hmm. but when we were kids growing up uh, um you just had no clue and you, it, it all ran through private property nobody cared that you walked through their property either nice. and you just fished it and i mean I, I you know i don't exaggerate we were catching 18 inch browns out of this little tiny creek and we just thought that was normal we had no idea it was outside of our little valley and mm -hmm. um but we just we loved it. We did that every day as kids. When we get school would get out in the summer, we'd go. And uh, I think that's kind of where I developed my love for fishing really is just on a spin rod. So I just throw a, a Panther Martin or a Meps and just pound rainbows and browns all summer. And then uh, then I got into fly fishing and that just took over and I haven't really looked back since. But uh, fly fishing has just been a really big, big part of my life. So that's cool. Um, is your wife into fly fishing, too? She's tried. She she's nervous to wade. She doesn't like wading. No. <laughs> she doesn't feel she doesn't feel as safe when she wades, but she does like to fish. Uh, so we'll do uh, when we can, we'll do some boat fishing, that kind of thing. And, nice. and uh, we have a little fly fishing club here that I can take her out where it's just, uh, you know, it's just stocked rainbows. But uh, she can stand on the shore and just and cast and, and get the feel for it. But she hasn't really gotten into it, but she does enjoy it. Yeah, I was going to ask if that's how you guys met was through um, fishing. How did you guys meet? We actually met on eHarmony when that was a thing back in the mid 2000 or early 2000s. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I, I remember eHarmony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We actually got asked if we do one of those commercials for them. Really? I turned it down. I was like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that's funny. The 15,000 questionnaire they have. Yeah. Like, this is the mate for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. That's no, but I, my, I got three boys and they're nine, seven and five. So they're all pretty close together. So I take them out as much as I can. Um, I try to get them into fly fishing. I've learned that teaching my own kids is harder than teaching college students how to fly fish, but it's just a patience thing there. So they just, they just want to whip that rod around. And, but that I will say that some of my most memorable fish are ones that they've caught while we've been fly fishing. And, and it's been a lot of fun to see them do that. And, take them ice fishing. That's a little easier for them. They can just drop it straight down in the hole and catch perch and bluegill. So it's, it's fun. Trying I'm trying to make it a family affair and get them all hooked to it so we can start doing trips when they're a little older. That's cool. And I saw on your um, Instagram, it looks like you guys do a little bit of hunting also. Yeah. Yep. Um, I like to do a lot of upland hunting. So pheasant what is hunting, it? upland, upland game. So pheasant, chucker. Oh, okay. I know nothing yeah. about hunting, so oh, yeah, my no, naiveness is going to show big time. <laughs> no, you're good. So, um, yeah, I have a couple of hunting dogs. I have a wire hair 
pointing griffin and an english setter and I like to get them out in the fall and do some hunting um not as big here in utah it's kind of shrunk quite a bit with all the population growth so a lot of our pheasant habitat has gone away and but once in a while i still try to get out but it's kind of tapered off the last couple of years unfortunately now did you train your dogs or did you have somebody train them I did train them and it shows it's not good. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not a dog trainer by any means, but no, they're, they're fabulous hunting dogs. The, the nice thing is, is uh, wire hair pointing griffins and English setters are pretty much born natural hunters. So um, got them on, you know, scent early, just wings off of uh, pheasants or live pigeons if I could find them. Uh, but I did get them on that, but uh, yeah, they're, they're uh, they're fun to hunt over that's probably the, the funnest thing about upland game bird hunting is is hunting over a dog and being able to see them work and, and work for that for you is, is really special it's cool yeah i bet we have a uh what is gus he's um yeah he's two years old uh chocolate lab oh yeah and it's uh it's funny to see as he's growing up like you'll see some of his uh natural instincts come out yeah to where one day we were in the living room and he was stalking something and i was like what are you doing and then he just kind of like head down looking up at me like i'm hunting i'm like what are you hunting <laughs> it's your stuffed animal whatever yeah. it was like he's got this uh he's got this little stuffed animal worm here <laughs> you know and i was like what are you doing just yeah. the instincts that kick in it as a puppy it was funny to see yeah we got we got backyard chickens last year and and my dog it was probably the worst thing to get for hunting dogs because they just go nuts now mm -hmm. like pick the scent up and I'll let them out in the backyard and they immediately go on point and I'm just like, <laughs> like oh, what, torturing them so have to take them to the dog park now instead of letting them out in the backyard because otherwise we'll end up with dead chickens eventually so <laughs> so those dogs I understand they're they're smart and they're basically like hunting instinctual. Um, but like recall wise, like when you guys are out and you got to bring them back, do they respond instantly? Uh, my English setter does not. She's still young though. She's, she's two and a half. Uh, she's the, she's been a big struggle for me as far as that um, retrieving or if she gets out too far ahead of me trying to get her back, reel her back in, but she's so birdy. If she picks up a scent, she's just, she's gone. And I, that's been a hard challenge for me to train that out of her. Uh, but my Griffin, he's, he's pretty steady. He'll, he'll focus, you know, 10, 20 yards ahead of me. Um, mm. He's pretty good and he'll bring birds back to me pretty steady. So that was something I was, that's why I was like, oh, that was easy to train him. He's, he's a gem. And then this English setter, she's got a mind of her own. So she's giving me a bit of a headache. What do you do to, um, train a dog for a recall um so i do a lot of long long leader a little long leash mm -hmm. on them so i'll run like a 30 40 foot leash and uh, just lots of, i i do lots of rewards so you know i, I have a clicker that i click mm -hmm. when they do something right i click and they know that they've earned a reward they come back that kind of thing um that's my main thing with that is i just uh, just lots of habitual stuff just going through the motions of that and it's, it's lots of patience, honestly. Um, but it's, you know, as, as a dog, I'm not a dog trainer by any means, but just consistent work with them over and over again, will typically get the results you're going to want. So even spending, you know, 15, 30 minutes a day with them when they're young like that, um, will help you when you're out in the fields, they're not off chasing a raccoon, yep. you know, up a tree and running away from you. Yeah. Cause when, uh, we, we took Gus out when he was probably about six months old and uh, I threw the ball out into the river and it went out a little bit too far to where it was kind of yeah. quick, but no danger by any means. And yeah, uh, I'm calling him back. I'm like, come on, Gus, leave it, leave it alone. And he's just like dog on a bone. Right. And, you know, I had my, my, my hip pack on and my wife's with me and we're kind of looking at each other like, mm, he's not listening. I'm like, gosh, <laughs> come back, buddy. Thinking the water, and he's still going. So I start taking off my hip pack, start running down the river like, I'm going to have to get wet. And then like he finally turns around. I was like, what's up? I was like, come back. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so we've been working on him with that. I've seen a video out there 
of uh it was a german guy that had a german shepherd uh-huh. and they're doing this uh display and they take them through all these commands it's like super strict military like and yeah he, he throws this ball and this dog takes off in a full sprint and he just like they don't whatever he says in german that dog just stopped on a dime and just slid i was mm-hmm. like that's what i'm talking yeah about. no kidding yeah cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was impressive. That's cool. So talk to me about rod building. You said you uh, did that for a little while. How long did yeah. you do that? So the same thing. So that all goes back to the Utah State classes, the mm-hmm. university classes that I teach. So I still do them. Um, I, teach a, I teach three fly tying classes a semester. And then I teach two fly casting classes a semester where we actually take the, the students out on the grass, just teach them how to cast. And then we take them fly fishing. And then the other one I do once a semester is a rod building class. So I'm doing that two times a year. And um, I did it when I was in college. I built my my first graphite fly rod then. And I was like, this is really fun. It's something just different. I, I've just always just kind of like to work with my hands on that kind of stuff. You know, whether it's, you know, woodworking or that, I um, by any, any means, I'm not a pro at that kind of stuff, but just like doing that thing. And so I started teaching the fly rod building class and that's just kind of spiraled into another hobby of mine where I really enjoy uh, rod building. And lately I've been doing a lot of fiberglass rods um, and it's just fun. The fiberglass is super fun to to fish and you get a lot of the cool colors and uh, so you can kind of make those really custom how you want to, how you think they should look and what you want out of a rod. But uh, yeah, I've been doing that now for the past, God, was that four or five years I've been doing that. So it's, it's a lot of fun and, uh, you know, it all kind of comes full circle when you get to tie your own fly, build your own rod and catch a fish on those things. It's, it's really cool to do that. And so my, my end goal with the the rod building is, you know, I'd like to, to build these fiberglass rods, sell a few here, on, here, here and there by any means, it's not going to be like a career or anything like that, just a side hobby. Um, but make some for my boys so when they grow up and get a little older, I can give them as a graduation gift or something like that and use them out fishing with them. What, how long does it usually, and I'm sure it depends on the rod, but what's the average length it takes to build a rod time-wise? So from start to finish, um, mm-hmm. you really dedicated yourself to it. Um, the wrapping of the rod typically takes the most and the wrapping is putting the guides on with the thread. Uh, that typically is going to take the longest uh, portion. Um, but if you dedicated yourself, it, realistically, you could you could finish a rod within a weekend on some of them. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it doesn't take, it, it, obviously, you probably don't want any distractions around. So sure. you could sit down on a Saturday and Sunday and get the, the handle on one day. And I usually like to let the epoxy and stuff settle for at least 24 hours. Let's make sure it's solid. And then from there, the next day, you could you could wrap those guides on within a day or two. So you're three days, maybe four, um, if you're really busting it. But most of the rods I do, uh, like I said, I, I'll come and tinker with them for a night and, and do a couple eyes each night. Um, I like to tie flies more, so I get distracted really easy. So I'll sit down and start trying to build a rod. And then uh, I'll be like, oh, I want to tie this fly. And I'll turn around. So that's my rod building desk, and this is my fly tying desk. So I just turn and Oh, spin. nice. So yeah, it's it's pretty fun. Walk us through the um the the process from like start to end on fly on a uh, rod building. So this is one I'm working on right now. Um, this is just a this is a five weight. It's an eight foot uh, five weight fiberglass rod, and I've kind of already started it here. But um, let me see if oh I do have another blank here. Let me grab you a blank and I'll show you. Um, if I can find it. Yeah, if you guys are listening. Court's just basically showing us the uh, rod that he's building. If you all want to see it, um, this will be posted up on the YouTube channel so you guys can see the uh, the rod that he is just showing us there. Okay, so this is a this is another blank I haven't started yet. Um, it's a four piece. The other two pieces are still put away. But this is an eight weight fiberglass. So this is a pretty heavy sucker. I'm going to use that for streamer fishing. Um, is kind of my goal there. But so this is one where to start off, you know, I'm going to end up putting the handle and the reel seat on this guy here. So that's what it'll eventually look like. Get so the, 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 the green, what is that? 
that's the color of the rod blank. So that's going to be a green rod. Okay. And then the, the, the butt section and all that gets built into that. Yep. So what I'll do is I'll take a, a real seat first. I'll put the real seat on here. So it's going to take up, you know, five inches or so. And then from there, I'm going to fit a handle to it and I'll put that handle down. I'll probably have a fighting butt cap on the end of that big full wells grip um, fly handle. Mm -hmm. And then from there, then I'll mark out my guide spacing. So like on this rod I'm building right now, you can see I've kind of started that. So I've got a, this is the hook keeper. I just, I'll butt that um, thread right up against the handle. And then I just start working down the way here. So, you know, the guide spacing is important. There's formulas for that. And we want to check that to make sure the guide spacing is all proper. Uh, that's the only guide I have on that one. But I usually mark out all my guide spacing. I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but there's little white marks on these. Oh, yeah, I see them. So all those are where guides are going to be. Okay. And so I just got to finish wrapping those on. Once I get those guides all, all on and wrapped, then it's good to go. I, I can go ahead and epoxy it. So there's a special epoxy they use for uh, rods, uh, flex coat epoxy. Uh, that's meant to kind of move and flex with the rod, you know, mm. so it's not super brittle or anything and i just put that onto those thread wraps and then it's ready to fish let it sit for you know a day or two after it let it dry and ready to go so how do you determine um what kind of action like if you want a fast medium or slow action are the blanks go ahead oh so i was just gonna say so the blanks uh the blanks i get are already pre-rolled so i don't do anything with like rolling the blanks or anything like that or making the actual blank itself i just buy those pre-made um, so I just look and say, so most of your fiberglass rods are going to be a slower action. They're going to have mm. a really big flex in them. So I kind of know that going in. If I want a fast action rod, I'm just going to, I'm just going to search that out and try to find something that's fast action. And I'll go from there and, and order a blank that's a fast action blank. Um, but yeah, so all these are going to be a slower action with this fiberglass, just because that's just the nature of that material is it flexes deep into the, the rod. Um, so it makes casting dry flies really nice. It gives a really soft touch when you uh, land that dry fly onto the water and super fun to fight a fish on. So if you haven't done it, it's, it's, you think a 16 inch fish or a 12 inch fish is a 24 inch fish. <laughs> so it takes some getting used to, but yeah. That's on a fiberglass rod. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I meant to ask you earlier when you were talking about, uh, your first uh, fly setup. Do you remember what that rod and reel setup was that you had? I do. Yep. What so was the it? Very first, the very first rod I got, like I said, my dad bought it for me. He took me into town. We picked one out. It was a combo kit. It was a Cortland combo kit. It had the 555 fly line on it, Cortland reel, Cortland rod. And I remember just standing in the backyard for hours, just learning how to cast. Like I said, there's no no YouTube back then. I had no idea. All my dad knew about fly fishing was 10 and two. Yeah. He's like, that's, you know, so it's 10, two, 10, two. And that's what I did in the backyard. And luckily for me, I just would hop on my bike and I'd ride down the street, two blocks to the, the stream. It was by our house. And I had no idea what I was doing. Um, two of the first fish I remember catching, uh, one was on an elk hair caddis and it was a really slow meandering part of the stream um just in some guy's horse field like i said it was private property they nobody cared back then that you were fishing through that and these fish were rising and so i had no idea what to tie on tied on an elk hair caddis made a cast and i just remember seeing this fish come up grab that fly and i pulled up I hooked it and i was just like ecstatic I was like that was so cool it was awesome and then the other uh fish i remember catching i was fishing a a little zug bug, a little nymph pattern. And I had no idea what a nymph was back then. And I mean, this was within the, you know, a couple of days of that brown trout or that caddis. And I was stripping that zug bug, that nymph back like a streamer. Like I had no idea. I was just stripping it. I was like, bam, I had one and reeled it in. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So that's, that was one of the first two fish I remember catching on a fly rod is pretty cool. Were those rainbows? They're uh, the one on the on the elk hair was a brown, and the one on the nymph was a rainbow. Yeah, yeah, brown trout. I would love to catch a brown trout. Everybody just tells me they're just so aggressive. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're they're a lot of fun. Um, the uh, 
biggest brag, I have to brag a little bit because I just bear, I I've always been wanting to catch that elusive 24 plus inch brown trout. Like that's like the goal, you know, like you want to catch a, a trophy brown trout. And we were out in Colorado last fall in November. We were making our way back towards Utah, went up to Wyoming and we were fishing the, uh, the Platte river there, the miracle mile, I think is what they call it in Wyoming. It's my first time ever fishing it. And uh, I was fishing a orange waltz worm, little euro nymph, but I was actually fishing it under an indicator and cast up in a, behind this, or in front of this boulder, let it come down through, and the indicator kind of stopped and pulled to the lo- to the right, pull up. And I just saw this big old bucket of gold just roll, mm. and I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is it!" And I yelled upstream to my buddy Chet, and I was like, "Dude, I got one! I got one!" And you know, I was so nervous that i'd sit there and play that thing and it, that hook would just pop yeah right and yeah so he finally netted that thing and i was like oh thank you so we didn't get a we didn't get an actual tape on it but we estimated it somewhere between 24 and 25 so it was really cool is that the one that um you have on instagram where you're on your knees yes. yep yeah yeah, yeah 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 i yeah. saw that one um when i was looking at your instagram i was like Oh, I gotta ask him about the story behind that <laughs> one. That, that's a good story. I like that's that. the, that's the one. I caught two fish that day. I caught one that was like ten inches, and then I caught him. So that made that made my day. Yeah, I see the cool. other one you have here too, um, in the other picture down below too, and then it looks like you did some uh, night brownie fishing too. Oh yeah, that was a really fun one. That's a cool one. Uh, so we. Uh, where were we at? We were night fishing. So it's a, it's a lake actually that we were fishing and you just go throw just these huge streamers. I mean, we're, we're fishing big white gray streamers, you know, six, seven inches long wow. and just stripping those in. And that guy just, just hammered it. Like it what, was fun. What are you guys using uh, weight wise for rods? So that I was using a seven weight. As yeah. Well. I was going to say that's, yeah. that's yeah. a, that's a big fly to be chucking. Yeah, so I was using a seven weight on that guy. Uh, yeah, that was that was cool. So night fishing for browns is really fun. Yeah, browns are extremely aggressive, uh, and they just explode on those flies too. Mouse mouse fishing for browns is a lot of fun. We've done that quite a bit too. I heard that is that's a riot. So yeah, we really love doing that. Well, that's cool. Well, before I let you go. Um, do you have any trips coming up in the foreseeable future? Are you going anywhere? Yeah, we do. We're going to go to Pyramid Lake here in uh, end of March. We're heading out to Pyramid Lake. We were there last year. Did really good. It was a lot of fun. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, go catch some big cutthroats. And then we float the Green River usually in April. And we go to the Madison in May. So kind of all in a row here. We'll be taking some trips out and it's where we get to do a lot of our research and development for new flies that we want to make for round rocks flies. And yeah, so you know, we're going to be on the road here in a little bit. Nice. What do you, um, do you have a preference of uh, waiting or, you know, on a raft or, you know, fishing from a, a boat or anything? Um, personally, I like, I like waiting, honestly. I just like to, to be more in the river uh, rather than floating by it. I know you can, I, I've done both. We do both quite a bit. But uh, float fishing, you know, you can get into a lot of fish that way and and cover a lot of water really quick. But wade fishing, I just feel like you just have the time to stop and really fish or run and dedicate that time to it and and try to work it rather than, oh, we got to get going down river before the sun gets down, that kind of thing. And, and cruising past a lot of spots, I'd like to stop and hit. So I like to wade fish more. Do you guys ever, um, um, I don't know what you'd call it, just bit like, in a raft or in a boat and then get out work the run you know wait it and then hop back in the boat and go through about that way yep yeah that's typically what we do um so like on the green river uh, here in april we'll go do that there's a big uh, blooming olive hatch that we like to go and target and that's what we'll do we'll we'll pull off to the side kind of locate a pod of fish that's rising and we'll work that pod you know for 10 20 minutes uh, 30 minutes, just kind of however they're responding to the, the flies. And then uh, we'll move on down to the next section. The problem with the Green River for us anyways, is we spend so much time on the first half of the float 
that we end up blowing past the last half because we got to get off before dark. So <laughs> it's definitely a time management thing, right? Yeah, yeah it surely is. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it's, it's funny because there's so many life lessons and skills that we learn from fly fishing, you know, oh, yeah. like that's one right there, time management, Yep. you know, patience and stuff like that. And I would say that, that's like, I th- I consider myself to be pretty good at time management and that's really benefited me, you know, when I'm, you know, float fishing from there. What yeah. are some of the things that you've either gained from fly fishing that's helped you out in life or vice versa? Um, I would say the biggest thing for fly, the fly fishing has taught me overall and it's probably, you know, been beaten over and over again, but it's just patience. I mean, it's, it's a learning curve. It, not every day is the same. You know, you're going to go out on the river uh, one day and you think you got dialed in and the next day you it's going to throw you off. You know, it could be a multiple of factors, dirty water, it's windy, it's whatever. And, you know, that's just life. You know, you're going to wake up and think hey, you got it all figured out for the day and you're going to get to work and it's not going to go the way you planned it or, you know, something happens within your family and that. So it's just adapting, learning how to adapt to those situations and you know, not being stubborn and fishing the same fly the whole day, switch it up. You know, you got to try something new and and figure that out. Uh, that's something I've learned from fly fishing and, you know, in life, um, I think the thing I've learned from life that I can apply into the fishing is not take it so serious. Um, you know, I, I get caught up in the social media game and I sit there and I'm like, I want to take a a great photo that's going to get everyone to like, just love it. And a million followers, you know, all that crap and I, I get so burned out on social media that I'm like it's just you know just have fun don't worry about who likes your photo and who follows you and who comments or whatever um, you know and sometimes don't take your phone when you fish just go and fish and enjoy nature and enjoy your life you know it's not what's on the screen it's what's out in front of you in a river and just being able to fish is is the blessing for all of us I think and I think we overlook that too much in our lives and we we just try to focus on the material side of it. And so, yeah, but yeah, I've learned a lot from both aspects and can apply them to both. It's, it's great. Man, that's a great way to end it right there. Well said. I like that. Yeah. Well, before we sign off, um, do you want to let anybody or do you want to let people know about any um, websites or shout outs to anything or anybody? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, obviously, you know, my own page fly cash, it's fly underscore cash is my Instagram handle. You know, I'd appreciate any follows or likes, you know, I'm, I, I like to educate. That's kind of what I'm trying to get more into is the education process of that. And I like to teach fly tying. Mainly it's fly tying for me. Um, but yeah, any, you know, any any help and support I like to, to reciprocate that as well. But uh, for me, I don't do anything commercially that I that I charge or anything like that. So it's just basically just fun for me on social media. But our company, Round Rocks Flies, um, you know that you can check out our website there. We're, like I said, we're a wholesale company, but anybody out there who you know is a guide um, or runs a shop or anything like that, you know we we offer wholesale pricing for them, and you also support us here locally in, in Hiram, Utah, by buying our flies. So that's that's also a great thing too. So RoundRocksFlies.com is is our is our company. Yeah. Um don't go anywhere. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. And then um, you and I will say our goodbyes. But with that being said, everybody, I will put those uh, links in the description below. So you can find court and uh, the website that he was talking about there. And as always, if you guys have any questions, comments, uh, find me on um, Instagram at Spay Rod Adventures. Um, Yeah. Till next time, I'll see you guys uh, later and make it a great day.